Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Dan Gregson. I'm the co-founder of a business called Electroheads, uh, which hopefully you will have heard of. If you haven't, we're doing something wrong. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to have alongside me two brilliant women who are uh, blazing a trail in our industry. Um, I've got Rebecca at the end, um, who's a UK general manager of Via Loco, a distributor, uh, and also Marie, um, who is the founder of NewGen. Um, so today we're talking about the road to retail. And what I quite like about that as a start point is that it assumes there's a definitive straight line uh, between where, wherever we are and that place called retail. And I think one of the things that we've been talking about is that there definitely isn't one straight path to retail. Um, what we have at the minute is a micro-mobility world which is uh, changing and shifting and it's, it's becoming new things by the, by the week. I was here at the event in Berlin uh, four, four years ago and of course the whole industry is more than four years old. So what we kind of have is a change in micro-mobility micro space and at the same time retail often driven by changes of consumer behaviour and technology is changing at, at, at light speed too. So what we'd love to do today is, is really get some insight from, from uh, Maria and Rebecca. Um, and we're going to have a chat and we're lucky enough to be here, have a conversation and really you get to listen in. It's going to be really informal. It's not going to be super structured. Um, as I say, Electreds is a media brand. Um, but recently, last year, we took the, the leap into retail. So we're now the biggest growing uh, e-commerce, e-mobility site in the UK. So anyway, right, let's, let's get to it. Um, Marie, why don't you give us a little insight into what your path uh, on the road to retail has been over the last couple of years, uh, what that's been for you as new gen, um, and what, what your kind of insights are around that journey. Yeah, sure. Um, so we so we launched the company around three years ago. Yeah. Um, uh, and all bikes which are built, made in the UK, which was really important for us. Um, all head offices in London. Um, and I think very early on, uh, we made the choice to have a retail location. Which is quite a big choice. It's quite a big choice, but I think the, the way we, we... We basically came at this from the perspective of we make good products um, and we want to connect with a customer. And in a market where um, there's a lot of competition, there's a lot of kind of new entrants kind of coming either way, all way in, in, in e-bikes. For us, it was about building trust, uh, starting to build a community with right. our customers and really realizes that we're selling a high quality product. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you want people to kind of come to see you, touch the product, see the product, talk to a real person, um, and also recognize that products go wrong. Right. You can, you can just, even as high quality as it can be, uh, things sometimes break. Uh, people have questions, and so uh, th there needs to be a real-life experience. Right. Um, and that's led us to open a store in London in <sighs> fairly quickly, I want to say, nine to 12 months after, right. um, after we set up, so, really. So that is quite a big strategic choice, really, because as a startup, you've only got finite resources. Yeah. So to make that choice at the expense of other choices is clearly something that you, you felt was important for your brand and the way that you can connect with people. Yeah, super important because if you're building a brand and you're basically building a brand around values, around quality, customer service, um, Britishness, British build, um, you need people to start to trust you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think there's no brand without trust. Um, and even just meeting the founders at the beginning, it was literally just me and Laurie, my other business partner. Um, usually important because otherwise, how can you tell your story? How you can people to buy emotionally in your product? How can you have people just realize the kind of attention to detail yeah. and the type of things that kind of go into just 
all all of the all of the supply chain before that. So Rebecca, from your perspective, from a distributor, one of the things that we wanted to do with this is kind of have a spread from retail through to distribution and manufacturer. What's your kind of perspective on on what the last couple of years have been like? You you have a background not just in micro mobility distribution, but also uh, other consumer electronics. What are the things that you've seen over the past couple of years uh, from your perspective? I guess what's important to note is that uh, we're based in the UK and we distribute in the UK and we are distributing primarily e-scooters. And in the, uh, the UK, they are still illegal. So it is a very challenging, uh, challenging market. Um, we got involved with e-scooters as we had traditionally uh, distributed consumer electronics goods, so white goods, sound systems, brown goods, and it kind of seemed an extension uh, that we would be able to distribute to all of our retailers who are in the consumer electronics space. As we quickly realised, they are not all comfortable with selling uh, e-scooters at the moment in the UK, given uh, the legislation woes that we have. Yeah. Um, so we've had to really adapt quite quickly and find a full range of retailers, all different types. You know, we're selling to consumer electronic stores, bike stores, uh, department stores, e-scooter mobility, micro-mobility boutiques. So I think what's interesting is that micro-mobility doesn't currently fit into one retail place. You know, it's such a wide range. So. For us, there's been a, a lot of learnings in the, in the first three years. We've had to be very adaptable um, because it is such a new industry. It's changing all the time, you know, and more and more retailers are interested and, and want a piece of the pie. So that interest is there. From, so, from uh, your perspective with those retailers, and as you said, you've kind of got a spread from kind of big boxes, consumers, uh, consumer electronics, right through to specialists. What, how do you see the, the kind of the different roles of those of that distribution mix for the brands that you distribute? I think your large consumer electronics stores, so in the UK for us, that's Curry's, they have this mass market appeal. So I see them as selling your cheaper products that will sit kind of in that 399 to 599 price bracket. I think more and more bike shops are wanting to get involved, and that's great because in the future, they will be able to offer that servicing element, which is so important for micro-mobility. And then we're getting more and more of these uh, micro-mobility specialist stores crop up, and they're going to be hugely important because as the market develops and the products get more mature and more expensive, you need a specialist store. You know, you're not just going out to buy a really cheap 399 product. You're going to be looking for something that is going to last you for years, is more of a vehicle than a toy, and you're going to want to test it and have that knowledge. So I think there is room for all these different types of retailers, but I guess it's kind of at different points on the customer journey and as that customer develops um, their product knowledge as well. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, I think, with one of the things that big distribution does is it effectively acts like a big advert for yeah. the whole sector. And, and I kind of have a particular view that uh, I'm not particularly a curry shopper. And as someone who is a big advocate for e-mobility, uh, I almost think that they don't care enough about our mission, but actually I think they're doing quite an important role of, of giving shell space and kind of are advertising our sector. And I think maybe from your perspective where you are kind of quite purist and you're very community driven, do you kind of see it as being okay that uh, big box retailers are stuck in micro-mobility or do you, do you feel that's stepping on the turf or do you think that's helping or? I think that's completely helping. I mean, at the core of what we do, we basically want to move as many people away from their car as possible into e-mobility. So I see different price points in the market and different types of products as a good thing. Yeah. Um, that's why we're here for. Um, and I think we also need to realize that we, we sell a transportation product. We don't sell, I think for a really long time, e-bike or some e-bikes were seen as a leisure product. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really good thing that e-bikes are starting to be seen as actually this is a real day-to-day -day mode of transport for me away from my car. And especially for all types of bikes that we're making, this is very much about how do you reduce your short-term, short journeys. Yeah. Um, so the high price point, we need to be humble and realize that people will take some time to make their purchasing decision. Yeah. And it's very much about us trying to understand what the customer journey looks like 
Uh, because if, for example, they see, I don't know, all bikes in one certain shop, one certain lifestyle shop in the first instance, and they're like, oh, yeah, that's cool. I have yeah. never... Um, and then they kind of go through their own um, little customer journey into different retail points combined with digital and everything. Um, that's when you have, in my view, the big impact of a really good multi-channel strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because these are big life decisions. It's like buying a car, you know what I mean? You can't expect that you see something. So, um, so I think it's good. I think it's a good thing, frankly. Yeah. And um, what I love about this event is that obviously we've got a lot of people who are deeply passionate about micro-mobility and we're all here to kind of geek out over that for a few <laughs> days. Um, but when you're thinking about retail and as a, as a distributor and the, the, the businesses that you're working with, who do you look at or are there brands outside of the category that you are borrowing from or that you're inspired by? Where, where are the overlaps with other categories and other verticals that either of you think are interesting to micromobility? Do you want to go ahead? I think wanna... I, I was going to say about in micromobility, because I think the pure electric story is a really interesting one. And there's some parts of it that they've done so well and they've really changed from being you know a retailer to a manufacturer but the way they've uh, created hype with their new products the pre-order you know it's following a lot of those consumer electronic techie products that we're used to you know like pre-ordering yeah. paying a deposit waiting for it to come and i think i'm seeing that more and more with mike from ability is that that is the direction that people are going is like developing that hype and having a drop of only this amount available and i think that's probably something we're going to see more and more, and it's kind of borrowing from your more consumer electronics uh, industry. Yeah. Yeah, and it, I mean, like, so my background before that is very much consumer and retail. So I've been working very different retail business across the board. I guess, I mean, it depends a little bit who you are mm -hmm. as a business and what you want to do. Um, we we've always come at it not necessarily from a tech angle so i think what the type of retail businesses i really admire are going to be the ones which are uh community building yeah uh, who provide a very simple friendly customer service around a high quality product uh, and are able to create that sort of closeness and that emotional engagement with the customer so that that person comes back and you kind of start to create this really healthy um relationship so it's, for me, this is, the, if I look at retail, and I'm going to take a complete extreme example, you look at, I even look at uh, retail shops like um, small craft coffee chain right. locally, yep. where you're like, a completely different product, completely different price points. But this is all about, okay, how do I create a very simple experience? Because we could say, we could talk about in, uh, how, how complex all products are. At the end of the day, we spent a huge amount on design because we want to make really high quality products, but that are very simple to use. Yeah. But we need to tell that brand story. We need to create that emotional piece. So for me, the, because of the nature of our business, I really look at these sort of community, local community driven um, and trust building businesses are the ones I really rate. Yeah. Um, if I was... If we were positioned more on the tech angle, my answer would be completely different. Yeah. It would be much more about tech experience in store and everything. We've always taken the view that um, we want something that is simple and friendly. Mm -hmm. um, and you leave all the work to us about making that a really high quality product with all the complication that comes with like really good design. Yeah. But the experience for me is what, so that, that would really kind of encapsulate right. how I would look at this, the type of businesses that I really look, look at. Yeah. And Rebecca, you, the nature of your business is you've got brands asking you to represent them all the time. Mm. Um, what process do you go through with your, you know, from your business model and the, the, the types of businesses that you want to represent? What process do you go through and, and what advice can you give maybe go to market brands and businesses about things that are on your kind of list of exam questions? Yeah, I think, well, we were quite lucky in that our first brands that we started distributing were really recognisable brand names like Ducati, Lamborghini, Jeep, Aprilia, Valentino, Rossi. So that was really helpful because if you're looking for a mass market product, 
for people who have never bought an electric scooter before. They think, oh, I don't know much. I don't know what brands to trust. But then they see a brand name like that and they're like, oh, great. Well, I know Ducati. I know they make good quality products. So in terms of picking mass market products, I think having a brand name is great. But obviously for all the newer companies here and that kind of thing, I think if it's if, unique selling points, you know, what is different about that e-scooter and how am I going to be able to present that to a retailer and say, you must be stocking this because this is why it's different to everything else. I think, you know, it's got to have that side of things. But at the moment as well, that price point is so important, especially in the UK where yeah. Yeah. Uh, people are not keen to spend huge amounts of money on e-scooters because it is such a new product. If it's not got something really unique about that scooter and if it's not got a brand name, it has to be affordable, unfortunately. But yeah. I think as we look at other markets that are more mature, like Italy, France, Spain, uh, Germany, um, then people are looking for quality. Yeah. And they want to say, oh, great, I get a two-year warranty with that product. Um, you know, there's 50 service centers that I can take it to. because I think that's another big side of it. People, as they start to do their research, once they've had their first e so they think, I want a better quality one, and yeah. now I'm looking for this, and I know I want this, I want suspension, I want this, and that kind of thing. I think that, and that's how the customer is maturing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a really important point, and, I, you know, we've talked about this, and I've had a few conversations today already around, if we just think about retail, there is a question of, well, what is that, actually? And, and I think it can be easy to assume that retail is just sales, or it's just about brand experience, and it absolutely is about that. But uh, to your point earlier, this is transportation, stuff goes wrong. And you, sometimes you can't just let it run for eight years and you're never going to hear from them. So I think retail is being redefined in this space or has to be redefined around the whole offer of, of yeah. particularly servicing and aftercare. I think that's so important because if you look at your people buying their scooter on Amazon or your local consumer electronics store, they're not going to have that after sales help that they need with the servicing. And for us, we had to learn quickly because in the consumer electronic trade, if you buy a TV, it probably won't break for the next eight years and you're good. The returns rate is so low. Yeah. Whereas with an e-scooter or any micro mobility product, it needs service. You know, you need fresh tires. You need this every six months. You should be checking it, which is why it's so important to have this network of retail stores across whatever country you're in that can offer servicing. Because I know some of the retailers that we work with say that, 90% of their revenue is coming from servicing. Yeah. And that's yeah. huge. That it's such a big part of this ecosystem and, and so important for uh, the industry to, to thrive. And, and I was going to add, from a manufacturer's standpoint, just having that permanent feedback. The thing that is so powerful about retail done well is that feedback loop that you create with like local preferences. Mm. Um, because countries will be different, different regions will be different. And from a sort of product dev perspective, it's massive mm -hmm. because, uh, and I think that's why we really like working with retailers. And as much as I like the pure D2C model, um, I think it's very, very expensive to get it right. Yeah. Um, so when you start to sort of create that, not just for an after sale perspective, but me, even more from a sort of feedback loop perspective on a product dev standpoint, uh, you, you create really agile and you actually start to do what you're supposed to do, which is make products that people want <laughs> rather than just push people like a yeah. one size fit all product on everybody. So, yeah. And to get that reach, I think one thing that we've had when we've spoken to some suppliers is like, as long as we have a shop in London, we're happy. I'm like, that's one very small part of the UK. I was like, <laughs> yeah. okay, so how are you going to reach Retailers across, you know, everyone wants to have one of these products, you know. Yeah. Everyone needs a local store, which is why it's so important for us as a distributor, trying to make sure you're hitting every single town that you can, especially then for that servicing side. So if something goes wrong, they've got some, somewhere to take it. So extending that reach and having hundreds of retailers that you're selling your products to rather than I'm going to focus on three main cities. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I, it's kind of interesting as well that because we're in... I don't know, is this a nascent category anymore? It's, it's not, but it kind of is in certain spaces. I think one of the things that I definitely pick up, and it's always been at the spirit of this event, I think, which is a sense of partnership and collaboration. And, and I think from my perspective, we're all trying to make a big difference. Um, but to do that, we need partnerships and we need to be able to yeah, work together. And I think 
one of the things that really is, is important on that kind of road to retail is that it is a road, it's a kind of a journey and it necessarily has different uh, groups of people who are adding different value through that, through that process. So from your experience, where, where does partnership come into it? When you think about partnership and retail, what does that mean to you and, and what kind of comes to mind? Loads. <laughs> Um, we, we can only work with partnerships, and, and I'll tell you why. It's because one, one simple, simply, um, it's nicer to do business with other people. Yes. Um, but it's also like we're, we know what we know and we don't know what we don't know. Yeah. And I think especially as a sort of small company, and even when we will be a huge company, yeah. um, I think I think it's important to stay humble in some ways. And like we are good at making bikes. We are good at getting feedback from people. We are good at creating these sort of agile loops of like understanding our market. But we need people like which is why we work so much with retailers, which is why we work so much with um for example, in an accessory range, we have our own accessories, but we like to work with British partners as yeah. well because they're very good at what they do. And we could spend years and money developing that. And at the end of the day, you basically, whether it's from the supplier side, whether it's on the product side, whether it's from the retailer side, you basically, I, I, where it gets really exciting is where you find like-minded partners. Yeah who share the same value as you, who want to do good as you, and will be the best at what they do. And your role is actually to see how, where you give, and where you kind of, how, how their relationship goes. I mean, we've seen that with you guys on the media side. Yeah. Now, more on the sort of retail side, the distribution here. And it's a huge market, so we need different people in the chain. And for me, it's where it gets really excited is when you find those like-minded partners. Yeah. yeah. And how you can actually build your own space um, into your own chain and be in, generally focused on what you're good at and leave the rest to the others. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say, everyone here has the same goal. You know, we want to get people out of cars. We want people making use of clean, sustainable transport. I mean, I'm not just speaking to retailers, I'm speaking to all of the other distributors in the UK all the time because we all have this same goal, you know, and it's, yes, there's healthy competition, but for me, I check in and say, how are things going? And then with working with the, depart with the Department for Transport now to talk about what will an, a legal e-scooter look like in the UK, and I can pick up the phone to the top five distributors you know, that we compete with and say, guys, we all have the same goal here. What can we do about it? And I think that's where this collaboration comes in. It's such a new industry still, if we look at it, like, yeah, you yeah. know. So I think everyone has to be there to support each other. You know, even if we aren't taking on new suppliers at a particular time, I'll still have a call with them and hear about what they're doing. How can I help them? Is there anyone I can introduce them to? Um, because everyone wants to do well, and I, yeah, I think we all have the same, you know, finish line in mind. Yeah, it gets to the point. I think most people are quite willing to give their time and perspective. Already, just in a few hours this morning, quite a few people have have almost shared more than I would have expected to in in that spirit. And I think that is something which, uh, having been involved in other industries, isn't always there. But I think we are. Uh, galvanized by a bigger mission and I think that purpose uh, does drive some of the the right behaviors actually in, in that kind of road to retail it, it, you and you will have every type of people who, who do things for many different reasons anyways and that's what I was telling you earlier um, it's just about finding the right partners who are good at what they do and share the same ethos as you and then from there on easy peasy and, okay. so, <laughs> and so given that we've got these two massive you know, the world of retail, which changes seemingly daily, there's kind of e-commerce, there's social commerce, there's affiliate, there's influencer, there's new models, there's... Dropshipping, um, which is now, dropshipping as well, which is now huge, yeah, yeah. becoming huge in micro mobility. Yeah. And then when you kind of look at that, what, what, are your, what are your hopes and fears for where we might get to in the next couple of years? What are the kind of things you look at and go, if we get that wrong collectively, that's a real problem? 
and but if we get that right, that's huge opportunity. What what are the kind of things that that come to mind? I mean, I hope that it gives so many people who are passionate about clean transportation gives them an opportunity to say, hey, I want to get involved. I'm going to open a local shop in my area, and I think there's so much opportunity there for people. You know, the more retailers you have that are passionate about it. The more suppliers and you know cool technology that you can get into different shops, and I think at the moment I keep harping on about the UK, but it's so the innovation isn't doesn't have any room to develop because of the delays to legislation. Whereas we see in other markets that we are kind of working in this enormous opportunity, and I yeah. think that's what we need to grab hold of, and that's why again these partnerships and all these things are are so important for everyone to be able to yeah, push that forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and we're we're in a certain economic environment. <laughs> so I guess for me, it's very much like, OK, how do we just keep the focus on doing what we're doing for yeah. the next 18, 24 months? Um, and my, my sense is, again, do you, do you, you said that a couple of times. Yeah. Do you say that because there's a, an observation that sometimes people don't do what they're good at and that sometimes within this sector people either overstretch or they try to be good retailers and distributors or they try to do too much what yeah totally right uh, totally and it's i think especially it's very valid when um in an environment where cash is really constrained because suddenly you have people's behavior who can become a bit like and you're like okay hang on <laughs> yeah. um so it's literally just sticking to and it, even I look at us, it's forced us to refocus on certain things. What is actually really important? Uh, what are the important partnerships that we need to put in place? Um, and everything else is noise. And what I think is going to happen over the next years is that, uh, as with any new market, there's been a lot of new, loads of noise, new entrants coming in, doing some good thing, doing some not good thing. And there's going to be a bit of a reshake of everything. Yeah. So um, it'll be an interesting thing to say. My, my biggest hope, and I think it's, we're seeing this happen, and I'm sure everybody of you see that happen, is that there's more and more trust and there's more and more shift from the mainstream towards trusting these modes of transport. I see mm. e-bikes, for example, yeah. and move this away from, oh, this is a bike, this is a leisure product too. This is how I want to move going forward. And that to me is the most exciting part. Amazing. Well, listen, it's pretty much time for you to go and have some lunch or go and get some fresh air or whatever it is you want to do next. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, it's been really uh, appreciated. We will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.